If uh, you have Bibles with you, why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew is the first gospel, first book of the New Testament. Matthew is one of my favorites, actually. Matthew 10, we're just going to read verses 32 through 39. And these are some, these are some hard-hitting words from, from Jesus here. This is, this is where he gets real serious. Matthew 10, 32. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's where we'll stop. This is one of those verses where Jesus either has to be some sort of raving lunatic cult leader, like a David Koresh or a Jim Jones, or he's really who he says he is, the, the Lord of all the earth. Because nobody else could make a claim that, that that's so drastic, where you have to put me first before your, your, even your parents and your children, your own family, your own life. This is really serious stuff. And it's really easy, instead of making Christ the center of our lives, it's easy to make God just a casual Facebook friend, if you will. I know that not all of you have Facebook, but uh, for those of you who don't, Facebook is, is an online uh, social media website where you can be friends with other people and you can exchange messages and news stories and all different kinds of things like that. And just for fun, to get us going here, I thought that I would look, look and see who in our church has the most Facebook friends. Just, I thought, huh, let's, let's see where this goes. And uh, I came up with four people, and I got their permission to have their names on the screen with this. So uh, that's, that's all cleared up. So number four is... Ooh, oh, man, we're doing this again. Number four is Sue Glasshauer, who has 812 friends. Yeah. And number three is... Leah Driesinga, we'll see if he can get that going. Number three is Leah Driesinga, 815 friends. Number two is Luke Ackman, 851 friends. And number one is Pam Driesinga, 1,143 friends. Yeah. It's not on the screen, but there's some popular people among us here. Yeah, I'm, I'm only way down at like 500 or so, so I'm way down, down the list. But when I was looking at, at uh, my friends, you see a lot of people that, that uh, yeah, they, there's, there's some really close friends in that list, and then there's some people you're friends with, and then there's people you just know. So, for example, I was looking at my list of friends, and uh, there are five Nancys on my list of friends. Five Nancys. One of them is my aunt. 
One of them is Deirdre's aunt, and then there's two here at church. So you've got to keep all of those people straight. There's four Michaels, and there's four more Mikes. Three of them are here, two of them are CRC ministers, and one's my brother. So you have to keep all of those people straight. There's six named Mark, and that's not counting my uncle, who's also named Mark. Um, four Andrews and one Andy, and then there's six each of Ben, Dan, Scott, and Steve. And uh, with the Dans, one of them's my brother-in-law, one of them's a CRC minister, one of them I know from seminary, and then 16 Johns. You know, when I'm, when I'm shaking hands at the back after church and stuff like that, it, I, 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 I usually get most people's names. Then there's sometimes it's like, I've shook hands with you for eight years. I've done all kinds of stuff with you. We've been on elders together. I've been on committees with you. And your name's just not coming to me right now. <laughs> Don't take that personally, please. That just happens sometimes. But there are friends who are more like acquaintances, right? We have people who are close to us, and we have people who are not as close to us. So we have friends who are more like acquaintances, and then we have really, really close friends. So if you have your, uh, your outlines in front of you, this is, this is where uh, you'll get to start. Acquaintances. You know their names and cross paths regularly. Your acquaintances, you know their names and cross paths regularly. You know their names, you cross paths regularly. And when you see them, you usually talk about work or weather. Or if they're a classmate, you talk about school. And if you had to spend an extended time with them, it, there would be some awkward silences, you know. You don't have a lot in common. Uh, you like them, but you're just, your interests don't match up that well. You could spend maybe five, thirty minutes with them. That's about, that's about the right amount of time. And if you lost them, you'd feel sad for a little while you lost them, then you'd, you'd feel sad, you'd feel disappointed, because there are people that you knew and saw regularly, you worked with them, you went to school with them, or you went to, you went to church with them, and so if they were suddenly gone, uh, yeah, you'd feel a little sad. Whether they moved away or, or passed on or something, uh, you'd, you'd feel sad. Those, those, are, those are acquaintances. Those are acquaintances. And then we, have, then we have friends. Those are people you like spending time with them, and you do fun things together. You like spending time with them, and you do fun things together. You have things to talk about and do together, but you also have some differences. You have things that you can talk about. You have things you do together. You have similar hobbies. Your conversation's enjoyable. You call each other to do something fun. You go to each other's homes. If uh, they were in need, you'd pull out maybe a hundred or two dollars to help them out because they're your friends. And the amount of time you could spend maybe an evening or a weekend with them, you know, depending on the circumstances or something like that. You know, you'll go over to their house for for the night for dinner or. Maybe you'll go on a camping trip weekend with them or something. And if you lost them, you'd, you'd be sad, but you would move on. You'd be sad. It would be hard. It would hurt. You would move on, though. So those are, those are maybe friends. And then we have close friends. We have close friends. And these people, they, they can be family members too. These close friends, you prioritize time with them. Like, it goes on your schedule. 
because it's that important. And being together is more important than the activity that you're doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing. What's more important that, is that you're together. So the conversation is exciting. There's no pauses. You probably, y'all have people like that. If you're apart for a long time and then you see each other again, you can pick up right where you left off. Real easy. You're, you're two peas in a pod kind of a thing. And you talk about personal stuff with these people that other people don't know. So your conversation even gets personal. You tell these people things that nobody else knows about you. And uh, you even adopt each other's habits. You learn stuff from each other. And if they were in trouble or in need, you'd empty your bank account for them. Because they're that important to you. And you could spend weeks or years with them, depending on who they are. You know, these, these, are, these are people who are like your, your roommates, maybe brother, sister, a parent, child, um, people that you could spend a long time with. And if you lost them, you'd be sad for a long time. You'd be sad for a long time. It'd be really hard to stop missing them because they're not just friends. They're close friends. They're people that you bonded with. But there's one more category. There's one more category. And that is worship. Worship, which means your entire life revolves around this. It could be a person, it could be a thing, it could be a goal, it could be an appetite, it can be all different kinds of things. But worship is a relationship. This, whatever this is, this is the love of your life. You could talk about this for hours, whether somebody who's listening cares or not. You could go on for hours and hours about this, and whether or not the person actually cares, their, their eyes might be just staring off into nowhere, but you're still going on and on because this is just so important to you. This is on your mind constantly. Your whole schedule revolves around this. Your whole schedule revolves around this. Back, back in the old days, um, when uh, it would be Saturday night, uh, people would actually make all of their food for Sunday on Saturday because church was so important. And all the baths would be taken on Saturday night. And a, lot of people, a lot of you know about that. And every like Saturday would be like almost an entire day of preparation for Sunday. Your whole schedule revolves around this and you crave time with this. You drop other priorities for this and you go wherever this goes. You go wherever this goes. You're hooked on this. This is the defining thing of your life. And you would empty your life savings for this. You would give every cent of what you own for this. Because it's that important to you. You would literally do anything for this. You would rather die with this than live without it. This is the defining thing in your life. That's worship. That's worship. And if you lost this, you would never recover. You would never recover. This is what you've called despair. Life is not worth living anymore. The defining thing in your life is gone. Life is not worth living anymore. 
So a question for all of us today is, where does God fit on this scale for you? Is God an acquaintance? Is God a friend? Is God a close friend? Or is he someone you worship? Do you like God? Or is he the love of your life? Look at the screen here with me and respond if you would. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. When we're born, we're born to love and serve something. We're born to worship something. And baptism is supposed to be a sign that we are clean from the normal things that we would ordinarily just worship automatically so that we would worship the true God. And that parents and churches would raise people to worship this one God and not anything else. If God is as good as we say, then worship is the only sensible option for God. If God is anything like we say he is, if anything at all, then worship would be the only fitting category for him. And Jesus doesn't want more likes on Facebook. He's not like that. He doesn't care about those things. He doesn't want more followers on Twitter. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants your life. He wants you. He wants you. God is good, just, and loving enough that worshiping Him actually makes you better. Worshiping Him actually makes you better. So, if you worship other things like maybe your kids or your family or money or things or pleasure or just sensual delights of one kind or another, if you put those things in the worship category, they'll destroy you. If, you, if your entire life revolves around one of those things, then you will be consumed. If you worship God, you'll actually be better. You'll be a better person. You'll be a better husband, wife, friend, worker, student, whatever. Because God is good and just and loving. And if you worship your kids, for example, you'll overfunction and smother them. If, if kids, your kids are the object of your worship, then you'll overfunction and smother them. And one of two things will probably happen. Either they'll never leave the nest and have the highest expectations for what you will do for them, or they will get away at the very first chance they can and stay as far away from you as possible. At least in my experience, that's, that's what I've seen. If you worship your kids, that'll wor- that won't work. That'll destroy you. It'll destroy your relationships with them. Let's say you have a spouse or a significant other. If you worship your husband, your wife, or a boyfriend, girlfriend, then you have a dysfunctional relationship. Because people are not meant to be worshipped. Your expectations of this person will be so high that they will either develop a God complex and treat you like a slave, or they will get freaked out and run away. If you worship your spouse or your significant other, 
then your relationship is dysfunctional and it needs work. You would make yourself a slave to all their wants and interests and all your hopes and joys and dreams and delights would all be fulfilled by a human being who makes mistakes and isn't perfect. That's impossible. There's no person in this entire world who could possibly make all your hopes and dreams come true. People are not capable of doing that. There's all sorts of other things you can worship besides God. Let's just take a look at some of them. Oops, that was not supposed to be there first. You can also worship sports teams or celebrities or pornography or entertainment, money and winning, sex, food, and health politics, any hobbies, or even yourself. And that top picture there, that's a little guy standing on a mountain with a flag. So you can worship yourself. You can be at the top of the mountain. But worshiping something else besides the true God, you will be owned, or as they say, whipped. You'll be a slave working all day for what amounts to essentially scraps. All of these things are worshipped by lots of people. And even a lots of people in this room, including myself, we have to fight against worshipping these things. Because there's always that temptation to put one of these things or something, something like these things just a little bit ahead of God. And we've got to be paying attention to that all the time. Because if we worship something else besides the true God, we're going to be owned. We'll be a slave. And we will be destroyed. It says in Romans 6, 15 and 16, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. We can be slaves to God, and we can be better people. Or we can be a slave to other things and we can destroy ourselves to one degree or another. That's up to you. Worshiping God, if God is the focus of your worship, worshiping God means maintaining the right balance of work and play, family and friends, enjoyment and service, and self and others. It doesn't mean that you have to deny all, all things that are enjoyable and never engage with any of them and become a monk somewhere in a desert somewhere all by yourself, growing your own food. It doesn't mean that. It means the right balance of all of these things. So work doesn't overcome your life. Play doesn't overcome your life. Family and friends don't overcome everything else and you're not living for pleasure which overcomes everything else it's about doing everything in the right doses at the right times and for the right reasons because God loves us our needs are important but so are the needs of others God loves us and so and we have needs. We need, well, let's start with breathing. We have to breathe all the time. Our needs are important, but so are the needs of, of others. And so, in order to make others' needs important, we need to balance our own so that we don't just walk all over other people chasing after something that really isn't going to give us what we want. 
God gives good things. An enjoyment of something is a good thing from God in the right doses. Enjoyment is a good thing from God in the right doses. There's nothing wrong with enjoying being married, having a family, good food, a good game. There's nothing wrong with those things. But we need them in right doses. If we go overboard, then we will start to worship those things. And that destroys us slowly. Worshiping God means no fear. It means you're not afraid of anything. It means no to sin, always hope, and unknown power to sustain you. Worshiping God means you have no fear. You say no to sin, and you can always have hope, and you have unknown power to sustain you. Each one of these could be their own sermons here. But if you have God, if God is the focus of your life, then what do you have to be afraid of? What is bigger than God? If you have God on your side, then you have everything that you could possibly want in Him. Why would you go chasing after anything else? If you do, then you're missing something about who God is. Because God is meant to satisfy everything. It means you always have hope because God can do anything. No matter what tragedies or disappointments that you have in your life, you can always have hope because God can do anything. And you have unknown power at your back. God can do anything. And He can do anything with you, too. If you put your trust in Him, you might find yourself being somewhere, doing something that you never thought would be able to happen at all. Me standing right here would be one example. When you're in too deep, only the Lord can rescue you. When a loved one is going down the wrong road, with God there's always hope. And even when there's a gun at your head, only God can take away your fear and make it okay. And the final thought for you, the more you know God, the more He will be the love of your life. The more you get to know him, who he is, what he's about, what his blessings are, the more he will be the love of your life instead of all this other stuff. So get to know the Lord and you will want him more than anything else and he will meet all your needs with the riches of his blessings. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. God in heaven, we have acquaintances and friends and close friends. And Lord, we have you. We pray, O Lord, that you would not be a close friend or a friend or acquaintance, but that, Lord, you would be what we worship. That we would revolve everything else around you that, Lord, you would be the defining thing of our lives and that, Lord, um, without you, we would have nothing. We pray, O Lord, that you would be that to each one of us and that, Lord, in doing so, we would see the fruit and the blessings that come from that. Help us not to put our trust in other things or in other people. Help us to put our trust in you. Help us to look for our hope, our joy, our fulfillment, everything that we need in you and what you do for us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.